Okay, just in the interest of time, uh, let's go ahead and get started and people will join us as they join us. Um, uh, we'll begin with introductions. So um, name, pronouns, organization you're representing and a brief visual description uh, of yourself for those with low or no vision or those who are on the phone today. Um, so I'll start. My name is Chris Talbot Heindel. I'm the communications membership manager at Rocky Mountain Wild. My pronouns are they, them. And uh, Rocky Mountain Wild is on the stolen and unceded lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, Nosheta, Shekawin uh, people. And a brief visual description, I am a light-skinned mixed-race individual with salt and pepper hair that's back in a ponytail, um, some clear glasses, tons of freckles, and I'm wearing my venison sage grouse hero t-shirt with a um, flannel over it. So I'll go ahead and pass it to Robert to introduce themselves. Thanks so much. My name is Robert Yukaili. I'm a senior attorney in the environmental health program at the Center for Biological Diversity. And um, our, we have an office in Denver and I live in unin unincorporated Boulder County and my pronouns are he and him. Thanks. And I'll send it over to Scott. Thank you, Robert. Um, my name is Scott Braden. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm here representing the Colorado Wildlands Project, and we are based, and I am working today in Grand Junction, Colorado, on the Western Slope. Uh, these lands are the ancestral lands of the Ute people. Uh, and a brief visual description, um, I'm male, uh, light-skinned, white, with brown hair, uh, a bit of a shoddy goatee or beard type of situation and uh, mid 40s in age. Today I'm wearing a gray hoodie. Uh, my background is my home office. And if you guys are lucky, we'll be graced by our yellow lab, Charlie, who likes to perch on the couch visual, vi that you can see behind me. Uh, I'll kick it over to Dylan. Perfect, thanks, Scott. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dylan Hanson Amata. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am with the Endangered Species Coalition. Um, I am a remote employee based um, in the stolen lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples uh, in Denver, Colorado. Um, and a brief physical description, I um, am in my mid-20s, male, I'm in my home office. Um, I'm a light-skinned, multi-race um, person, and I'm wearing a black sweater today. Thank you. And I will pass it back to Chris. Thanks everyone. Um, so what we'll do uh, is um, go in the order of Endangered Species Coalition, Colorado Wildlands Project and Center for Biological Diversity. And everyone will um, talk a little bit about their action and we'll open it up to questions. And uh, we'll just play it by ear and see how everything's going. Um, if you could have your chat open, that'll be easier for people to like drop links in the chat as they're, they're talking and sharing. Um, their actions. So um, just be aware that chat will be active. So uh, Dylan, whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see. And just want to confirm that you can see my, um, my screen and my PowerPoint. Perfect. All right. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much, Chris. And um, I'm super excited to be here and talk to everyone today. Um, and yeah, super excited to be a part of Rocky Mountain Wild's Day of Action. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, we already did introductions, but just once more, um, my name is Dylan Hanson Amata. I am the new Southern Rockies field representative with the Endangered Species Coalition. Um, based on the lands of the Arapaho and Cheyenne people, also known as Denver, Colorado. Um, I work on 
uh, a big bucket of things for the Endangered Species Coalition, but one of the main things I've been working on recently um, is wolf conservation in Colorado. I'm sure many people are familiar with um, Proposition 114 to reintroduce wolves to Colorado, and I'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, a little bit about the Endangered Species Coalition. So um, we're an environmental nonprofit. Our mission is to stop the human caused extinction of our nation's at risk species, um, to restore their habitats, and, and basically help these populations um, come back from being endangered. Um, how do we do that? And what do we do? Uh, we mainly work to safeguard and strengthen the Endangered Species Act, which protects endangered species. Um, I do this through grassroots mobilizing education, campaigns, um, basically trying to get everyday people involved in the work and advocate for uh, what they want in their environment. Um, and then who we are, the Endangered Species Coalition um, is a large group of uh, member groups and individuals. So um, we have a lot of volunteers and activists as well as a lot of um, other conservation member groups that are a part of us. Perfect, so today I'm gonna to talk about bit about wolf conservation, like I talked about, um, which is quite timely because of Colorado's recent passing of Proposition 114, um, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. But I, what I mainly want to do today is share with you all some resources that allow advocates to engage with wolf conservation planning. Um, and these resources that I'm about to share were put together by ESC as well as other conservation uh, groups that co-authored them. Um, and they can be found on wolfplanning.org, which is that link that you see on the screen there. Um, so like I said, um, the materials I'm gonna show were co-authored by uh, five conservation groups and an independent environmental attorney. Um, it was about 10 months of work that went into these resources. I was not a part of the Endangered Species Coalition when these were created, but I'm here to represent them uh, today. Um, and early drafts of these documents were reviewed and critiqued by um, many other conservation groups, academics, research scientists, um, retired and current state federal agency staff, as well as tribal representatives. So yeah, the two main documents or resources that I would like to share are our wolf conservation planning guides. Um, so there's two different guides as seen here on the screen. Um, one of them being the advocate edition, the other being the agency edition. So um, the advocate edition is the, the main one I'm uh, pushing today because it's made for advocates and people and the public to use to get involved with the wolf conservation planning process. Um, so the purpose of these documents, uh, the first one being the advocate edition is to help wolf advocates understand um, what the landscape of wolf conservation is, what they're up against, um, it kind of helps them know what they need to advocate for, provides you with published papers, reports, things you can cite uh, when you write and testify or speak to other people about wolves and wolf conservation. Uh, the aim is to give you the understanding, tools, and materials you need to change the course of how wolves are managed um, all across the nation, state by state. And then the second edition, being the agency guide, um, has the goal of highlighting the many places where agencies and advocates agree identifying those areas where we repeatedly clash um, with one another and then set the stage for discussion and dialogue on the principles we're proposing. Um, this is kind of um, just the table con of contents for the um, advocate guide. So it's a 22 page document. So um, it's pretty large, but as you can see, um, there's a lot of important contents in the guide uh, talking about best available science, uh, equitable, inclusive, and transparent decision-making processes, tribal sovereignty, sovereignty um, et cetera, et cetera. So it has a lot of great information for those that are interested in learning about wolf conservation and management, um, as well as learning how they can um, educate themselves to then advocate and comment um, in state forums. Um, as well as the two main guides, there's three appendices that are attached below um, the advocate guides, which people can um, educate themselves with. So these are the three different appendices. The first one being um, the perils of state politics. So this just, just serves to uh, educate and make advocates aware of um, the state of the perils pretty much, um, or what happens with um, state politics and wolf planning. So 
Um, often state wolf planning processes and plan implementation are subject to powerful political forces that uh, can change uh, what the agency's public or technical advisory committee process decides upon. Um, second document is called Words Matter. So I really uh, like this document. It talks about how language and words currently in use um, are often an obstacle to change. So it provides examples of phrases and words that should be changed. Um, one example would be um, saying changing take or lethal control uh, to wolf kill order or killing of wolves. Um, this just um, is transparent and words like take or control often obscure the fact that the animals being controlled or taken are really being killed. Um, so a lot of things like that just to um, improve the uh, language of our advocacy. And the last deck document shares common pitfalls to avoid for public advisory groups engaging in wolf conservation planning. So a lot of resources and documents that can help um, advocates do their work. Um, the last very large uh, resource that we have on our page is the Comprehensive Resource Bank. Um, so it's 166 pages of science, reports, surveys, in-depth discussions. So basically this is what you can use to cite um, and make um, your arguments from. So that is also available on the page. Um, and yeah, so the main goal of these documents is trying to emphasize that it's time for agencies to change how they steward and view wolves, um, not as an obstacle to overcome, but as a conservation opportunity to celebrate. Um, so to achieve this paradigm shift, these materials ask agencies to adhere to these key principles um, and explain in those documents why they're needed. So those key principles being acknowledging the intrinsic value of wolves, um, following and using the best available science, respecting tribal treaty rights and cultural significance and ties to wolves, uh, upholding democratic processes for public involvement, um, addressing livestock wolf conflicts through proactive non-lethal means, prohibiting recreational wolf hunting and trapping, and considering ethical implications of actions on individual wolves and packs. So those are kind of the key principles that we're trying to get across with these guides. Um, and then the question is, will this work? Will uh, these documents help advocates really get to the state agencies and, and make change? So um, the, the fact of the matter is that public opinion is changing. So even though state wildlife agencies tend to cater to traditionalist values, um, a lot of social science informs us that the majority of Americans um, uh, no longer hold the traditional value that wildlife is solely here for human use. Instead, a lot of Americans view wildlife as part of our extended social network, um, worthy of care, ethical consideration, and having that intrinsic value. Um, it, of course, won't be easy. Agencies tend to be very immovable forces, and um, the political influences on them are heavy from a lot of different areas. Um, but we do think these resources can help shift that paradigm. And because the guides are focused, principled, and coherent, they're the types of um, tools that have the best chance of success in creating change and um, really shifting the paradigm around wolves, around wolf conservation. Um, so we're really excited for you all to read them. Um, and the co-authors look forward to your feedback and to hear about your experiences putting them to use. Um, and speaking of putting them to use, one way you can do that is in Colorado's um, continued uh, wolf ring introduction plan. So um, as most people know in Colorado, Proposition 114, a ballot initiative recently passed in November 3rd of 2020. So um, this directs the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to make a plan to introduce gray wolves onto the Western slope of Colorado. So um, like I said, this has to be done um, by the end of 2023, so it will be coming fast. And right now, what Colorado Parks and Wildlife is doing is um, starting to create that plan and that reintroduction plan, the management plan, um, and take um, bits of pieces from everyone. So this is a great time for the public um, to get involved and um, share their opinions and thoughts. Um, so like I said, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission is gonna develop that plan to reintroduce and manage gray wolves um, which will be in the state no later than uh, December 31st of 2023. 
Um, they're holding state hearings about scientific, economic, and social considerations. They're obtaining public input to update the plan. Um, and then they're gonna use state funds to assist livestock owners in preventing conflicts um, with gray wolves and pay fair compensation for livestock losses. So um, as they create this plan, there's a lot of opportunity for the public and advocates to send comment to Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, so that's what we're pushing for today. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. So um, this link here, which I'll be happy to share in the chat after this, um, takes you to an action page that the Endangered Species Coalition has put together. So um, it allows you to put in your information and um, it has a pre-written message with some of the talking points from the guides that you can send to um, the commission. But we also encourage you to um, look at the guides and look at all the documents and write your own comments. So you can definitely just read that and send your own unique comments. I think um, the commission really values uniqueness in these comments and, and voice. So definitely encourage people to do that. Um, and then if you don't wanna use that action page, you can send your comments or uh, directly to the Parks and Wildlife Commission email that they've set up for this, which is wolfcomments at state.co.us, which I'll uh, also put in the chat. Um, so yeah, I'll put all these helpful links in the chat, like I said, but um, ideally what I'd like to do is briefly just show you the page so I ensure that people have access and know how to manage that wolf planning um, page. So can you now see the wolf conservation planning website? Perfect. So yeah, when you go to this website, um, this is where the guides are housed and all the resources. So. Um, wolfplanning.org is the website and you can view the advocate guide here. Uh, when you click on that, it'll take you to the, the advocate guide, uh, which I, like I said, is 22 pages. Um, a lot of good information here. So you can download that to your computer or just read it right on the website here. And then at the bottom are those three appendices, the parallels of state politics, words matter and the public advisory groups. Um, so you can read more about those as well. And if you do end up using these guides um, and reading them and sharing comments, we'd love to hear about your experience. So there's a share your experiences page here where you can um, put in your information and describe your experience using the guide or submitting your questions. So uh, we encourage people to do that if they end up using them. So um, the website's very easy to use. You can download all of the content to your computer and print it if you would like. Um, and then as well as that, I'd like to briefly click on the action page we have set up. Um, and thumbs up that you can see the action page. Perfect, so yeah, this is the action page that the Endangered Species Coalition has set up. So um, you can put in your information. And like I said, this message here is um, some key points from the guides and what we think um, should be in comments to the uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission. But you can also, like I said, make those unique and look at the guides and formulate your own comments and thoughts there. So we encourage people to do that. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing. Let's see here. Perfect. Um, yeah. And yeah, stop sharing. And I will share those links as we go on. But I want to thank everyone for joining and listening in. I'm exciting, excited to hear the other speakers. So I will pass it back to Krishna. Great. Um, do we do we want to do we wanted to do questions at the end? Right? I don't remember what we decided. I'm happy either way. Okay, uh, let's do questions at the end to make sure we get through everyone's presentation. So next is Scott. Thanks, uh, Chris. And let me just share my screen as well. Can folks see my screen? Great. Um, so once again, uh, my name's Scott Braden. I'm the director of the Colorado Wildlands Project, and we're based on the Western Slope of Colorado. Um, <clears throat> what we do, the Colorado Wildlands Project, we work to protect um, BLM roadless areas or BLM Bureau of Land Management uh, public lands that are in a roadless or wildlands uh, condition. We're dedicated to the conservation, uh, climate resilience, and equitable management of these public lands. Uh, we rally support 
around wildland protection in Western Colorado, and we collaborate with partners, uh, be they tribes, uh, communities, uh, public lands, advocates, recreation, uh, hunting and fishing communities, um, and all sorts of partners across the Colorado Plateau to build um, inclusive and powerful coalitions. These lands are threatened by oil and gas drilling, mining, uh, ramping up recreation pressures and other types of development. And the Colorado Wildlands Project is building support uh, for protecting these BLM wildlands in Western Colorado. Uh, we organize communities to rally around public land conservation uh, and urge our elected officials to protect Colorado's spectacular wildlands. Now, I wanna describe the photos as I go along. This is the Palisade Wilderness Study Area. Uh, it's one of our great BLM wildlands uh, in Gateway, Colorado, south of where I sit in Grand Junction near, Gate, uh, near the town of Gateway. So <clears throat> the Colorado Wildlands Project is powered with coordinated support from a wilderness workshop based in Carbondale and the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance based over in Utah. Um, the Colorado Wildlands Project is a small startup group we only opened for business as it were in December of 2020. Um, so to be better at what we do because we're small and because we wanna really get started quickly, uh, we've partnered with our neighbors both to the east and to the west over in Utah because both Wilderness Workshop and SUA are very good at what they do as advocates um, and help us to be better advocates uh, at the Wildlands Project. So why, why the Colorado Wildlands Project? Um, Colorado's 8.3 million acres of Bureau of Land Management um, public lands, administered public lands, make up about a third of the federal public lands in our state. But only 8% of these lands are permanently protected uh, with such things as wilderness, national monuments, national conservation areas. And that's at a rate that's less than other public lands types in the state, such as Forest Service lands. Colorado's at-risk BLM wildlands include a half million acres of wilderness study areas or WSAs, and we estimate about 2 million other acres of additional wilderness quality lands. Congress has not acted since 2009 uh, to protect BLM wildlands in Colorado uh, with the designation of Dominguez Escalante National Conservation Area and Wilderness. So it's been a long time. Um, and we feel that there's a huge opportunity right now to increase protection for public lands uh, and BLM wildlands in particular. Um, you know, with the new presidential administration, which I guess not so new now, quite a few months in, but with the opportunity of the America the Beautiful goal of conserving 30% of the lands and waters of the United States by 2030, the so-called 30 by 30 goal, um, with a new senator in Colorado, uh, Senator John Hickenlooper, we think the time is uh, pretty ripe to elevate BLM wildlands for conservation. So our goal is to make sure that the Colorado Plateau um, and the BLM wildlands on it in the western part of Colorado aren't left behind for conservation. <clears throat> so a little more about our geography. Um, we are an advocate at the Wildlands Project for all BLM lands in Colorado, but we put particular focus on lands on the Colorado Plateau. So if you see the yellow circle uh, on this, that indicates the Colorado Plateau broadly, um, you know, encompassing Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, we're really focused on the parts of that yellow circle that fall within Colorado. So that could be, um, you know, where I sit in Grand Junction to the north, uh, in the greater dinosaur, Browns Park and Vermilion Basin part of the state, uh, the White River and Book Cliffs and Rome Plateau area to the north, as well as the Dolores River and its canyons to, to my south. So the main buckets of work that we work on are um, increasing permanent conservation. So things like wilderness and new national monuments, um, and, uh, you know, just to remind folks that wilderness and national conservation areas are designations uh, that can be bestowed by Congress. Um, so we work with, you know, Colorado's delegation to support those types of designations. Um, we also work to be part of 
fostering the conversation in Colorado about what types of national monuments we could be advocating for um, in a Biden administration, um, national monuments being a tool that the president um, has for protecting public lands. The other big bu bucket of work that we uh, engage in is administrative work. So um, planning, NEPA projects, things like that. Uh, we engage as the BLM amends its land use plans res or resource management plans and those processes to um, try to increase conservation for public lands in those, in those settings. We can also advocate for protective designations that can be administratively um, designated. Uh, a great example of that that we're currently working on is um, to restore, we're part of a national campaign to restore the BLM's ability to designate wilderness study areas or WSAs. Um, they have not designated new wilderness study areas since 2003 um, because of a legal settlement between the Bush administration um, and the state of Utah that had a national freeze on creating new WSAs. We're working to get that unstuck to give the BLM its primary and best tool um, for administratively protecting lands um, and helping get towards 30 by 30. Um, I'll describe this photo. Um, this, is, this is a photo of the Green River in Browns Park, um, looking into Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, the place is called the Gates of Lador, um, and it, it's really kind of a centerpiece spot in the greater dinosaur um, landscape. <clears throat> um, this sort of, I've talked a little bit about this in the last slide, but again, just to summarize, you know, we, we campaign um, to protect uh, more wilderness, more designations. Um, we also work to make sure we increase conservation and BLM land use planning, as I mentioned. Um, what I didn't mention is we also will work to stop bad projects that might impair wildlands, um, think oil and gas lease sales, uh, things of that particular, maybe recreation and trail proposals that would harm wildlands character. Um, and then finally, we work to support policies of the BLM, like I mentioned, creating new wilderness study areas that enable um, greater wildlands protection. Um, so this is a photo of the Dolores River uh, in Soamup Mesa Wilderness Study Area. It's a south of uh, Grand Junction. Um, and it's just sort of a striking reminder that we have a lot of red rock, uh, canyon land types of landscapes in Colorado that one frequently associates with Southern Utah. <laughs> but those are present um, on Colorado's portion of the Colorado Plateau as well. So today is about a day of action and we could use your help. Um, so um, we are asking today for folks to send a letter and tell Senator Hickenlooper to prioritize protection of our BLM wildlands um, and to make sure that he's in equitably engaging all Coloradans in the conversation about what lands we should protect in Colorado. Um, all too often in conversations about what should be protected on public lands, there's a huge emphasis on certain local stakeholders that have really outsized representation. And in particular, it tends to be rural county commissioners um, who have oftentimes almost a veto power over what ends up being legislated or what doesn't. And so we're not only asking Senator Hickenlooper to engage in protecting these places, but to do so in a more equitable way that raises and includes all the voices of folks in Colorado and doesn't over rely on um, really some of these local um, local local attitudes, which sometimes can be very hostile to conservation. Um, I've included a link uh, to take this action uh, similar to Dylan's presentation. Uh, that link will take you to an action page uh, where you can enter some information in fields uh, and it'll send a note automatically to um, Senator Hickenlooper, that note can be modified or personalized um, as, as you see fit. Um, so we really appreciate folks taking the time to do that today. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank Rocky Mountain Wild uh, for the opportunity to present today uh, at this Wild and Scenic Day of Action. Thanks, Chris, for hosting. Uh, and I guess we'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions when we get to that. Thanks, Scott. 
Um, we'll we'll just go directly to Robert, and then we'll do questions at the end. Thanks. Um, I wanted to echo the thanks to Chris and Rocky Mountain Wild for putting on the Wild and Scenic Film Festival and for providing this opportunity to talk about actions. Um, as I said before, my name is Robert U. Kiley, and I'm an attorney in the Environmental Health Program at the Center for Biological Diversity. The Environmental Health Program works on um, reducing toxic pollution to benefit um, both humans and and not humans. Um, I'm going to be talking about ozone pollution today, which people commonly commonly refer to as smog. I don't have a presentation, meaning I don't have a PowerPoint, and um, I'll try and be quick so that we have plenty of time for questions should anybody have them. So I'm gonna give a little bit of background about ozone and then um, explain the uh, current situation in Colorado and then talk about two um, relatively straightforward asks that people can make of both the state government and the federal government to try and reduce ozone pollution. So um, when I say ozone pollution, I am talking about ground level ozone. A lot of people are familiar with the um, ozone layer that exists high in the um, atmosphere and it protects um, life on earth from, from harmful radiation. Um, but ozone can also exist down at the ground level where um, people and animals um, and plants are exposed to it. So the common expression or little saying is good up there, bad down there, or bad down here. So ground level ozone um, causes a wide variety of problems. In terms of humans, those most at risk of adverse consequences from ground level ozone or smog are the elderly children, people that exercise or work outdoors and people with pre-existing lung disease such as asthma and COPD. Generally, when agencies look at the impacts from ozone, they mainly focus on asthma. Um, and ozone can both cause people to develop asthma and also trigger asthma attacks. And it can also lead to people dying, both from asthma attacks um, and from other, um, other underlying health problems. So ozone is, um, it's different from a lot of other pollutants, air pollutants for a couple of reasons. One is that it's generally not directly admitted. Like it doesn't come directly out of a tailpipe or, or a smokestack. Uh, so it's referred to 
as a secondary pollutant um, because it's made from the emissions of primary pollutants. So the pollutants that contribute to ozone are nitrogen oxides, um, which people refer to as NOx, and volatile organic compounds, which people refer to as VOCs. And so when those two groups of chemicals react in the presence of sunlight, that's how we get from ozone. And VOCs and NOx come from a variety of sources, but predominantly it's from fossil fuels, either extracting fossil fuels or processing them or burning them in their end, end use. Um, so the ozone layer levels in Colorado are the highest in the Denver metro North Front Range area. But people often think of the air pollution as like a urban core or downtown problem. But actually when it comes to ozone, the ozone levels are the worst at the, um, in the foothills. So um, at the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, which is in, um, well, people refer to it as Golden in Jefferson County and the Rocky Flats um, National Wildlife Refuge um, and, um, and Chatfield Reservoir in Douglas County, they tend to have the highest ozone levels in the state, significantly higher than like, um, you know, downtown Denver or downtown Fort Collins. Um, in the last two years, Colorado Springs has also seen exceedances of the standards for ozone that the US EPA has set. Um, but again, it's not, um, well, they don't actually have a monitor in downtown Colorado Springs, but the high levels are seen at the Air Force Academy and, um, and um, outside of, of Colorado Springs. And um, because it's not directly admitted, but it is formed in a, in a reaction, um, it's the, the chemistry of it can be a little bit complicated, but long story short, on days when ozone is its worst, um, about half of the local ozone comes from uh, cars and trucks, and about half comes from extracting oil and gas. So more or less from, from fracking. Um, that's you know, a, a very general way to, to describe that. And obviously the polluters themselves try and create a different story where they try and blame other sources. And unfortunately, the governor and the state agency that is supposed to protect us from ozone, the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment and their Air Pollution Control Division, they spent a lot of time this summer trying to misinform people that our ozone problem is caused by um, smoke from wildfires. And that was 
um, very, very misleading, but they do get points for having what people refer to as message discipline. They just continually try to blame our ozone problem on, on wildfire smoke. Uh, again, um, it, it can be complicated. There are, um, I would say, relatively rare occasions when wildfire smoke does make ozone worse, but there are also occasions when wildfire smoke actually makes our ozone levels much lower. So for example, I remember in 2017, there were a few days where the wildfire smoke in, um, in the city of Boulder was so bad that you, know, you couldn't see more than a couple of hundred yards. And actually, and that was a summer day and our ozone levels were very low um, for a summer day. And partly that has to do with chemistry and partly it has to do with, again, um, ozone, the reaction between those chemicals is um, driven by sunlight. So obviously smoke can just decrease the sunlight and the four result in, in less ground level ozone. Um, so so that, um, that narrative that um, our ozone problem is called is caused by smoke is is very misleading. Um, and pollution from from cars and trucks has been decreasing um, pretty continuously and continues to do that um, because of cars are just and trucks somewhat are, are getting cleaner as time goes on. Um, but our ozone pollution from the extraction from oil and gas has been increasing as um, more and more oil and gas is extracted in Colorado. And that kind of makes um, Colorado an outlier in that most of the country has seen a downward trend in um, levels of ozone. But Colorado is an exception where we've seen our ozone levels um, increase or at least not decrease. And again, that's mainly driven by the rapid ex expansion of oil and gas extraction. So I am gonna propose two actions that folks can take to try and um, reduce ozone levels. One is to ask the US EPA to bump up our rating of um, ozone. So just like they have those terrorist um, level warning levels at airports, you know, it can be like green or yellow or orange or whatever. Um, the ozone problem also has a rating system and it's um, five levels. So the least bad is marginal and then it goes marginal, moderate, serious, severe, and extreme. And currently the US EPA rates um, Metro Denver and the North Front Range as a, um, as a serious um, area. And the area is quite expansive. It, it extends from um, you know, the half of Rocky Mountain National Park that's east of the divide all the way to the end of Lake Adams in Arapahoe County 
and it includes um, Weld and Larimer County in the north, all the way down to the south of Douglas County. And so that area currently has a serious rating, but the data shows that we should be rated as severe. And even the state agency, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has conceded that the monitoring data shows that we should be rated as severe. But the US EPA, as is typical of them, unfortunately, is just sitting on their hands. They have not um, taken the formal action to bump us up to severe. And it's a very straightforward action. They just look at the monitoring data and say, if it's higher or lower than the standard. So the standard is 75 parts per billion of um, ozone. And in the last three years, we've been above that. And so they should bump us up to severe. And when they bump us up, that requires that the state put more protective measures in place to um, limit the amount of ozone precursors that industries like the oil and methane gas can put out. So you can contact the US EPA's Region 8, which is the region that covers Colorado, and ask them to bump us up to severe, bump the Denver Metro North Front Range up to severe for ozone. And in the chat, I put the contact information for the acting regional administrator, so the person that's in charge of Region A, her name is Deb Thomas, and you can call her or email her and ask her to bump us up right away. The other opportunity is that the state is doing a rulemaking to regulate greenhouse gases from the oil and gas industry. And the pollution that contributes to climate change also contributes to ozone. And I'll also mention that ozone itself is a greenhouse gas. Ground level ozone contributes to climate change directly, but also many of the pollutants that contribute to climate change, like methane and ethane, also contribute to ozone. So the state's doing this rulemaking. Part of the rulemaking is to require for the first time that the oil and gas industry actually test its smokestacks to see how much pollution is coming out. And as you know, folks in Colorado, or many folks in Colorado, have to get their cars tested to find out how much pollution is actually coming out of their tile pipe. But if you're an oil and methane gas company, you just currently, you just write down how much pollution you think is coming out of your smokestack without any actual testing. And the state says, okay, we believe you. But for the first time, they're proposing a rule to require the companies to test their smokestacks. Um, but the rule is full of holes and the state may capitulate to the oil and gas companies and their allies in local government, mainly the Weld County commissioners, they, they could cave and not go forward with that rule. So there's an opportunity for people to submit comments on that rulemaking and 
the comment would be straightforward that the state should require all oil and gas smokestacks to be tested at least every three years. And there's an opportunity to submit live over Zoom comments orally and the information for that I put in the chat, or you can submit written comments. And again, I, I put the email address um, in the chat to do that. And um, it's just comments, or sorry, cdphe.aqcc hyphen comments at state.co.us. And those comments are due November 30th. You can also um, go to the Center for Biological Diversity's website and sign up to be a supporter. And then we'll be sending out action alerts to ask people to take those actions. So um, actually, that took longer than I thought. Um, and I will stop and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Um, we had a question for Scott in the chat. Uh, Wild Connections is advocating for the Colorado Wilderness Act and with six new wildernesses along the Arkansas Canyon, plus all the Western ones, also BLM management focus. I'm wondering about more direct involvement with you or would that spread you too thin? And that's from Gene. Well, Gene, thanks for that question. And um, the Wildlands Project, we certainly wanna cover and be a friend to groups working across the entire 8.3 million acre range of BLM administered lands in Colorado. Um, so I do occasionally participate with Wild Connections and others uh, like in the coalition uh, for the RMP revision uh, for that part of the world in the Arkansas River Canyons. Um, with regard to that legislation, <clears throat> so there's two main pieces of legislation uh, for public lands pending before Congress right now. Um, the Colorado Wilderness Act, as, as Gene mentions, as well as the CORE Act. Um, and they, they are both uh, have passed the House of Representatives multiple times uh, and are awaiting action in the Senate. Um, the Colorado Wilderness Act is sponsored by uh, Representative Diana DeGatt from Denver. Um, and the Wildlands Project certainly supports it. Um, it would protect about 660,000 acres in total uh, of public land. Uh, the majority of that is BLM land. Um, right now, we are working to try to um, <clears throat> convince our senators, uh, Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Bennett, that they should support the Colorado Wilderness Act. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, and part of the action today is to build general support. And uh, for, for part of the action we're asking people to take is with an eye towards getting our senators to not just sponsor their own legislation to protect BLM wildlands, but also to support the Colorado Wilderness Act. Um, and if they have a problem with it uh, or objections to it, to come to the table with Congresswoman DeGette so that this could be sorted out and um, we find a way to move forward with this important bill. Thanks, Scott. Um, the next question is also from Jean for Dylan. What is the most effective way to counter disinformation about wolves? Yeah, great question, Jean. Thank you for the question as well. Um, yeah, there, good point that there's a lot of disinformation about wolves. I would say one of the best ways is um, just to use best available science and make sure science is part of the discussion. Um, that will often curb a lot of disinformation about wolves and, um, you know, statistics about livestock take and stuff like that. Um, also in the advocate guide, um, one thing that is pushed along those lines is to fund state wolf programs to further the public acceptance of wolves and promote coexistence. So kind of educating people, educating hikers, educating hunters, educating everyone about, um, you know, what wolves do on the ecosystem is important. So um, yeah, I would say science and education could definitely help counter that. Thanks, Dylan. Um, the next question comes from Terry. Uh, she says, wow, I learned so much about ozone. Thanks, Robert. 
Has there been an organizational sign on letter on this issue? Rocky Mountain Wild would like to support it. Um, there, there's not one, thanks for that. Um, we appreciate all the support we can get. There's not one pending right now, um, but I'm sure there will be in the future and I'll work hard to try and remember to send it to you. Thanks, Robert. Does anyone else have any other questions? You can feel free to come off uh, mute if you wanna answer on the call or drop it in the chat. I'll just uh, give some space for that. Okay, well, it uh, looks like there's no questions. Um, so I'm just gonna use our last minute to talk a little bit about the rest of the activities and to thank Scott, Dylan and Robert for joining us and for sponsoring the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. We really appreciate your support and uh, bringing these actions to us today. Um, so there's one more day of action. I'm gonna drop that into the chat. And that's with Defenders of Wildlife and Simple Switch. They'll be talking about um, protecting biodiversity and moving towards a waste-free lifestyle. So I'm dropping that in the chat. We also have the Wild and Scenic online auction going on right now. And uh, there's a bunch of really great items from uh, environmentally friendly organizations. And there's actually the very last Gunnison Sage Grouse Hero t-shirt that I, this is an example of it, uh, designed by yours truly. So it's a collector's item. It's the very last one um, at the auction. So if you feel so inclined, please uh, do bid often and generously. And then uh, the Wild and Scenic Film Festival, which is the, the grand um, event, which happens on Thursday. We have five films that we're going to be um, screening and we'll have an online chat where you can talk to Rocky Mountain Wild staff and other attendees and just enjoy an evening of environmental films. So thank you everyone for joining us and especially thank you to Scott, Dylan and Robert for sharing those great activities and I just want to leave some space if anyone had any questions that came up. Last call. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you later on this week. Thank you. Thank you.